Hello, good evening, good afternoon. Um, welcome to the first uh, lecture uh, prepared by the Society for the History of Czechoslovak Jews for this new starting season. Uh, we have a lot of speakers tonight or this afternoon, and uh, we are happy that so many of you are joining us to listen to their wonderful conversation. Uh, my name is Pavla Niklova. I'm uh, the board member of the Society for the History of Czechoslovak Jews. Uh, I would like to say a few technical things at the beginning. This is a webinar, so unfortunately our speakers won't be able to see the attendees. However, you can send us your questions through the Q&A and uh, the panelists will be here to answer your questions after the talk. Also, the talk will be recorded and will be available on YouTube later. And uh, I would like to ask my colleague board member, Mrs. Vera Kalina Levin, to introduce today's speakers. Thank you, Paula. Good afternoon and also good evening to those joining us from England and Europe. My name is Vera Kalina Levin and I'm a board member of the Society for the History of Czechoslovak Jews. I'm here today to welcome you and our three guests in our virtual program. We'll hear a discussion about a fascinating person and personage in the cultural and intellectual life of Slovakia in the second half of the 20th century, Agnesha Kalinova, my erstwhile na namesake, but no relation. The name Agnesha Kalinova may be recognized by some of you is the name of a prominent journalist, translator, and film critic in Bratislava in the 1960s. She was in those years associated with the greatly esteemed cultural weekly, Kultur Neživot, which helped sow the seeds of the coming liberalization socialism with a human face. Led invasion of 1968, Agnesha was imprisoned along with her husband, Jan Ladislav Kalina, a renowned writer, journalist, film and theater director and satirist. Following their release, they emigrated to Germany where Agnesha became a political commentator at Radio Free Europe in Munich. With Jana Juranova as her co-author and interlocutor, Agnesha Kalinova captured her winding and tumultuous life in a memoir titled in English, My Seven Lives, for which both Agnesha and Jana were awarded the Egon Erwin Tisch Prize in Prague. The memoir was translated into English by Agnesha's daughter, Julia Sherwood, and will be published in mid-October by Purdue University Press. We are delighted to have with us Julia Sherwood joining us from London, Jana Juranova from Bratislava, and Peter Brod from Prague. Julia Sherwood is an award-winning and highly prolific translator of literature to and from several Central and East European languages. She studied English and Slavic languages at universities in Cologne, London, and Munich where she wrote her master's thesis on the Czech Jewish writer, Jerzy Langer. Julia's translations of Czech and Slovak literary works have been published by leading independent publishing houses in the UK. This includes her most recent translation, that of Alena Monsteinova's Czech Holocaust novel titled Hannah. The English version was published by Parthian Books in 2020. Julia also curates a website dedicated to Slovak literature, is an organizer of events that promote Slovak literature and culture in the UK, and reports on the literary scene in Slovakia, the Czech Republic, and Poland in the online journal for literary translation called Asymptote. Before she dedicated herself full time to literary translation, she worked for some 20 years for Amnesty International. Jana Juranova is an acclaimed Slovak writer, playwright, essayist, and translator. After working as the literary advisor for a theater in Trnava, 
and as a freelance contributor to Radio Free Europe, she co-founded the feminist educational and publishing project Aspect, where she is still a coordinator and editor. She has translated over 20 books from English, including such authors as Virginia Woolf, Margaret Atwood, and Alexander McCall Smith. She has written short stories, novellas, and novels, including her latest novel, The Wretch, which was published in 2020. Several of her books have been translated into Czech, English, French, German, and Hungarian. In 2018, Jana received a presidential state prize for her literary activities and the promotion of human rights and democracy. Petr Brod is a highly respected journalist and historical political commentator based in Prague. After completing his studies at the University of Munich, the Harvard, he worked for many years at BBC Radio and Television in London at Radio Free Europe, where he was Agnesha's colleague, and at the Süddeutsche Zeitung. He was both BBC and Radio Free Europe's bureau chief in Prague. His recent activities have included presenting the program Historical Magazine on Czech Public TV's news and current affairs station, City 24, and chairing debate, debates on contemporary and historical topics at the Jewish Museum in Prague. Peter is a member of the boards of the Czech German Future Fund of the foundation of the Prague Jewish community, as well as of our society for the history of Czechoslovak Jews. And I, now please join me in welcoming our guests, Julia Sherwood, Jana Juranova, and Peter Petr Broad. Thank you. Thank you too. Uh, perhaps I should say something because there is silence now. Are we going to have greetings from New York from the Slovak Consul General as expected? Oh, no, he, he couldn't make it. <laughs> ah, so the floor is open to the discussions, to the panel, so to speak, if I understand the situation correctly. Yes, yes, okay. please go Thank ahead. you very much. Okay, that clears the situation and uh, then I would like to uh, express uh, my gratefulness for the invitation and uh, put in a small technical remark. Uh, the lady we're going to talk about in this conversation is known as Agnesha Kalinova officially, but as Vera has mentioned, Agnesha and I were colleagues at Radio Free Europe and we became good friends until her last moments. We uh, saw each other almost every month uh, in her last years because I would go from Prague to Munich uh, to pursue my hobbies at the Bavarian State Library and elsewhere. And this was always an occasion for a long uh, and uh, beautiful dinner with Agnesha, who was very active until her last months of life. And therefore, I always refer to her by a nickname, namely Agi. And uh, if you allow, I shall continue that practice even now. Uh, I will now turn to Julia, Agi's daughter, Julia Sherwood, and ask her to present to us a more extended version of Agi's life than was, uh, the, than was presented by Vera. Vera gave us a few uh, keywords. Uh, but Julia will be more systematic in her depiction of uh, Agi's life starting in Eastern Slovakia. Agi, the, uh, Julia, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Peter, and uh, uh, thank you for inviting us and for hosting this event uh, to the Society for the History of Czechoslovak Jews. It's really nice to be here. 
and to present uh, uh, my mother's memoir, co-written with Yana Uranova. Uh, the basic facts of, about my mother has or, have already been outlined, and I don't want to bore you, so I thought that rather than repeating them, I would just highlight some of the main uh, milestones in her life and illustrate them with some photographs, uh, which I've prepared, and I will now try to share my screen, which I hope will work if I can find it. Uh, this is a bit of a problem. I will con try continue. <laughs> we tested this before we started and it was all working out wonderfully. I think now we can see it. Okay, wonderful. So, uh, my mother, uh, Agnieszka Kalinova, was born in 1924 and uh, she died in 2014. And uh, as you can see from this wonderful photo, uh, I think she, uh, this photo really shows her. Re her spirit, her interest in everything in life. She was just a remarkable personality. Uh, she was so full of energy and vitality that, uh, as Peter said, until her last moments, we all expected her to live until the age of uh, 100. She also had uh, incredible memory and uh, she just retained so many facts of her life. And I think all that has really in informed the book. So uh, as uh, Petra already mentioned, uh, my mother was born in Preshov in Eastern Slovakia and had an idyllic childhood there uh, in a secular Jewish family. Uh, she was growing up uh, speaking Hungarian at home, Slovak at school. She was uh, studying German with a governess from the age of, uh, from a very early age. And uh, she also studied French uh, with a friend uh, of her, mothers, uh, Olga Barkany, uh, who was the wife of Eugen Barkany, uh, on whom there was a, a webinar, uh, I think at the beginning of this uh, series uh, in Jan January 2020. And uh, on the left, you see a watercolor of a portrait of my mother uh, painted by Eugen Barkany. And on the right is a picture of my mother as a 15 year old uh, in the happy days, just before Jews were expelled from schools and she had to leave the uh, Evangelitska Gymnasium, the Lutheran college that uh, she was attending. This, uh, these next two photos uh, show the period when the clouds were already gathering. On the left, she's with her friend Marta Vadas already wearing the Stars of David. And on the right, uh, she is uh, with her parents. This is the last uh, photograph they had together. Soon after that, uh, the, the first, uh, first transport of uh, Jewish young Jewish women from Slovakia uh, was organized. My mother managed to escape by pretending to suffer from sciatica. And uh, then uh, together with uh, the friends, the Barkans, uh, the couple, uh, she uh, managed to flee to Hungary, uh, where she spent most of the war hiding in a convent. Uh, while her parents sadly uh, didn't make it, uh, they stayed uh, back to look after uh, my mother's grandmother, and they were deported to Auschwitz, where they both perished. After the war, uh, my mother returned to Slovakia and uh, was uh, reunited with uh, my father, whom you can see here on the left, very, very thin. Uh, they knew each other before the war and on the, the left is a photograph that my father took of her on her 17th birthday. And uh, once married, she started uh, studying French, but uh, soon uh, dropped out because she was uh, more interested in pursuing her career as a journalist. She became a film critic. On, her, on the left is a photo of uh, her and my father at, uh, I, I believe, her film, first film festival at uh, Marianska Lasnie. And on the right, uh, she is uh, 
pictured a, a film set uh, of a, a Slovak film directed by uh, Stano Barabash. In this photo on the left, you, you see her with her friend, the Czech film critic uh, Galina Kopaneva. And on the right uh, is a legendary photo now of the uh, editorial team of Kulturny Život, the cultural weekly that uh, my mother worked for, a paper that was at the forefront of the uh, Prague Spring of the attempts to uh, reform uh, socialism. Uh, as we all know, uh, this attempt failed. Uh, it uh, ended abruptly with the Soviet-led invasion uh, in 1968. Uh, my, both my mother and my father uh, lost their jobs. They were first they were expelled from the Communist Party, then they lost their jobs, and they were banned from publishing. And very soon in 1971, we made this unfortunate discovery on the left. This was a bug that we found under the floorboards uh, in my father's uh, uh, study uh, under his desk. Uh, and a year later, uh, the arrest followed. Both my parents were imprisoned. My mother was uh, held in custody for 10 weeks and then, but charges against her were dropped. My father was charged uh, and sentenced to two years imprisonment for incitement uh, of which he served one year. He was then uh, released uh, on, um, after an amnesty. But uh, the persecution of our family did not stop. Uh, we kept being harassed. I wasn't allowed to go to university and eventually uh, we decided as a family in 1977, we applied to be allowed to emigrate. On the left is one of the last photos taken in, in our apartment in Bratislava. My, you can see my parents. On the right is a photo taken on the balcony of our flat, which we sent out as a farewell uh, postcard or my father sent it out to all our friends with a text uh, see you again at, in better days at six o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, after arriving in Munich where Peter Brod was one of the uh, friends who welcomed us and who helped my parents to find their first uh, accommodation there, my mother embarked on a new career as a political commentator and she stayed in this job until after 1989, after the revolution. She continued working uh, well uh, un into her 70s uh, until Radio Free Europe uh, packed up and moved the uh, office to Prague. And on the left in the photo, you see her uh, with Václav Havel at a uh, emigre uh, meeting in Franken. And on the right, she is pictured with her best friend, Eva Trachtova, uh, with whom she was re reunited because my mom traveled very often back to Slovakia uh, after uh, 1989. And uh, when uh, her memoirs were published, uh, we took a road trip around Slovakia uh, with uh, my daughter. And on the left uh, is a picture we took in a, a bookshop in uh, Kosice, I believe, where her book was displayed alongside uh, a book on uh, Queen Elizabeth II. And on the right, I don't know if you can see the photos on my screen, they're actually covered by our pictures. Uh, she's with uh, Shari Spier. Uh, so My Seven Lives was published in 2012 in Slovak. Uh, my mother uh, still signed a contract for the Czech edition, which you see here in the top. Uh, she also supervised the uh, early days of the work on the German translation. Sadly, she didn't live to see the uh, Hungarian tr translation, which appeared three years ago, three or four years ago, uh, or uh, the English edition, which is now uh, being published by Purdue University Press. And uh, copies can already be ordered from Amazon. And uh, I would like to also express my thanks here to Slolia uh, for supporting this book. This is uh, the uh, funding agency of the Information Center for Literature, uh, as well as the uh, as Arts Council Slovakia, Fond na podporu Romania. So that I think completes the brief survey. survey. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julia.
And we now turn to Yana Yuranyeva, the co-author of the book. As you have heard and seen, the book has the form of a lengthy conversation between Agi and Yana. Now, Yana, when did you first come across the names of the Kalina family, especially of Agi and ja, Ladislav Jan, who was also known as Lazzo? Um, it was not uh, something very special. Uh, of course, I knew the name Jan Kalina as the author of the Book of Jokes, as everybody in Slovakia or in Czechoslovakia. Uh, but I haven't in my, in my mind any context of Agi and uh, Jan Kalina and jokes and all of this. Uh, maybe because I'm a little bit younger than Yuka and our, the, at that time, um, the times went quite uh, quickly. After 68, uh, I was a child in 68, 69. And then when I started uh, studying in gymnasium and then in um, um, university, uh, I learned later on that uh, I lost a lot of people, for example, from normalization because they were just, uh, they were, they missed, they were missing in, in university and they were missing in culture. And many things were just stopped to be editing, publishing and so on. So many, many names just uh, started to be uh, for me interesting after the November of 89. And one of them was also Agnesha Kalinova. Um, I met her only maybe in 90, 91. Uh, I went with my friend, a friend of mine, a girl which was a literary critic. We went to Carlo Vivari uh, as a, yeah, a group of young people. And she met their Agi because probably they had some uh, communication on, uh, on film critics. And she told me, just you will see this lady uh, with this sunshine face and <laughs> that was it when we met uh, somewhere there in Karlova Valley uh, Agi was just smiling on us and she she met me as if we were friends <laughs> which was quite uh, it, it was very nice but uh, then I haven't met her for some maybe year two and later on we started to be colleagues when I started to work for Radio Free Europe after this uh, November uh, when the Radio Free Europe was very important in Slovakia mostly because of materialism and so on and so on. So this was the first encounter with her and I just uh, it was very remembering for me I when I met her in Munich I told her, yes, we, we have met in Karlovy Vary, and, and that was it. Uh, perhaps I should uh, include a short remark about Ladislav Jan Kalina, because you mentioned him as the author of anecdotes. Yes. Well, he yes. may have been the author of many anecdotes too, <laughs> but he was mainly known as a collector who yes. also wanted to publish anthologies of uh, uh, political anecdotes, and this caused him some trouble in Slovakia. He collected political anecdotes from around the Soviet bloc, which eventually also were published abroad in a big book. Uh, and the, this, these activities uh, contributed to his imprisonment in the early yes. 1970s. Uh, yes. But let's return to Agi now. So you met her first uh, at length, to, uh, so to speak, uh, when you joined uh, the staff of Radio Free Europe in mm -hmm. Munich as one of the first Slovak intellectuals to do so. It was sometime in 1990, 91. Mm -hmm. What were your first impressions then of Agi as a colleague and friend? Um, my impression was absolutely, we liked the, her, all of us, young people at that time. Uh, Luba Lesna, uh, Yul Yulka's friends and her schoolmate, as I know, uh, she was with me in the Radio Free, Free Europe and she also told me that this Agi and Yulka was working at the, in, at the time in Amnesty. So uh, the context was for me very friendly and, and we were like friends from the beginning. I, I just haven't any memories, any other memories, only very friendly and very open from her side to all of us. Um, she loved young people, 
she loved the companion of, of younger people and uh, uh, it was for her something very refreshing maybe. And for us, it was like if she was one of us. I, I, I was looking at her. Of course, I, I knew that she's maybe even uh, elder than my parents, but I was looking at her like a friend of mine, which is quite young by her spirits. And, and um, we met quite often when, the, when I was in Munich, uh, either most time with some other uh, friend or, or, or colleagues. And we were going together to dinners and uh, we were many times in her flat, sitting, drinking coffee, talking and so on. So even shopping, even going to museums and, and so on. So um, we were some, some kind of lost in Munich because there was, you know, we, we were alone there. So she was a companion for me. Even we were maybe in some uh, bus, uh, bus and so on. So many, many, many activities <laughs> after the work. It was, I, I, it was very nice to have that. Did your conversations then focus on current affairs and cultural affairs and so on? Or uh, was there from the start uh, a chance to speak about her past, about her youth? in pre-war Slovakia about her adventures during the war, about her post-war development and the way she found her way uh, to be a, an individual strong uh, voice in Slovak culture and how then uh, she had to emigrate and so on. So was the scope of your conversations her whole life? No, at that time when we, when we were meeting, uh, from time to time in Munich, mostly we were talking about current things. Uh, sometimes we were visiting uh, other other people in Munich, and we, uh, she was not she was not talking about her personal history or or something like that. Sometimes she she talked about it, but not. Uh, somehow epically or something and uh, I I was not uh, I was not asking because it was something like that uh, what she wants she says but but I'm not asking more some of these things were of course um, very unpleasant and very um, you know maybe uh, not so like for everyday conversation uh, so at that time, we were not talking about things which are in the books, in the book, not, not so much. Mm -hmm. Mostly about current things, politics, work, radio, people, and so on. The most dramatic years of Agi's life were those of World War II, when her parents, who were aware of the deadly danger emanating from the Nazis, sent her away from Slovakia, and she was taken in by nuns in a monastery in Budapest. Uh, but after the Nazis moved into Hungary in the spring of 1944, even there life became extremely insecure for Jews as both the German SS and local fascists hunted them down in order to send them to Auschwitz. Uh, to give you the feel of Agis' narrative of those days, uh, Julia and Jana prepared an extract from the book in which Agi describes how after two years, she left the relative safety of the convent with Marika, a local Jewish girl who had also been hiding there. As with another except later, Jana will quote her question to Agi and a few sentences from her answer in Slovak. This will be followed by the English translation read by Julia. So now I will start with several lines. To bolo v čase, keď sovietská armáda už vnikla na maďarské územie a z východného Maďarska evakuovali najdôležitejšie úrady a inštitúcie, utekala odtiaľ aj časť obyvateľstva. V meste Kečkemed mal rád dobrého pastiera filiálny kláštor. Kečkemecký kláštor sa už evakuoval, mnišky sa zväčša aj chovankyne odtiaľ už boli v Budapešti, takže v našom kláštore mali naozaj nedostatok miesta a, a bol tam aj zmetok. Pri evakuaci niektoré chovanky nevyužili príležitosť a ušli. By then, the Red Army had advanced into Eastern Hungary and key offices and institutions were being evacuated from that part of the country. Part of the local population was also fleeing. 
The order of the Lady of Good Shepherd had a branch in Kachkemet, which had been evacuated. The nuns and most of the wards had come to Budapest, and there was overcrowding and confusion in our convent. Some of the wards took advantage of the evacuation and ran away. So the nuns gave the two of us the papers of two girls from the Kechkamit convent who had never made it to Budapest. Most importantly, they gave us a stamped and signed application for resident permits in Budapest, as well as refugee certificates showing that we'd come from Kechkamit. And they provided us with a cover letter explaining that we were wards of the Kechkamit convent, which had been evacuated, and that we were permitted to live outside the convent because of a shortage of space. So we left the convent with these three pieces of paper issued in the names of real people who had fled on their way to Budapest. My papers were in the name of Gisela Kercho, a woman who was five years older than me. I tried feverishly to memorize her date of birth and her parents' names. Luckily, there were no further details in the papers. All this happened in late October. That means we left the convent in the most dreadful of times, just before the Battle of Budapest. Jana, could you read the question? Uh, yes. Kam ste ušli? Kam ste išli? Uh, where did you go? Marika and her late mother had always been on good terms with a woman who used to clean their house. The cleaner's husband was a deckhand with the Danube Shipping Company, and they lived in quite a rough neighborhood, the workers' quarter of Andjalföld on the Pest side of the Danube, across the river from Obuda. She let Marika and me stay with them, provided we paid rent. Marika swung into action right away. She was friends with some young men who must have been connected to the Zionist underground. We would meet them out in the street. She would tell them about the sort of documents she needed and for whom. They knew some forgers and gave us fake documents, which we would then take to the ghetto, where all the Jews of Budapest were gradually being herded. Uh, you didn't get fake papers for yourself? No, we didn't. So did you think those wonderful documents you got from the convent of the Good Shepherd were sufficient? So you focused on getting fake papers for others? Yes, we thought they were perfect. They were genuine after all. But let me add that we were incredibly lucky. We left the convent at the most dreadful time uh, during the Nazi coup. Regent Horty, who'd been secretly negotiating the capitulation of the Hungarian army with the Soviet Union, was placed under arrest. In mid-October, the leader of the fascist and rapidly anti-Semitic Arrow Cross Party, Ferenc Szálasi, came to power. The Jews of Budapest, over 200,000 people, were under imminent threat. In the course of a few months, between October 1944 in February 1945, when the battle for the city ended, more than half of the city's Jewish population perished, mainly in death marches to concentration camps. Lots of people were dragged out of the ghetto by the Arrow Cross, tortured and murdered. Hundreds were shot on the bank of the Danube so that their bodies would be carried away. So if you had stayed in the convent, you would have been safe there until the end of the war. We could certainly have survived until the arrival of the front. We would have been out of harm's way. My daughter could never understand how I could have involved myself in such a risky caper. What had gotten into me to make me leave this safe haven at the last minute? Now with hindsight, I have to admit that Marika and I were really reckless and took a huge risk. Nevertheless, I don't regret leaving the convent. It helped shake me out of the weird passive state that I'd been plunged into the moment I left home. This was the first time I could decide for myself about my own fate. In some ways, those weeks in Budapest under siege were an amazing experience, and I was even able to help save a few lives. How did you come to terms with all your losses after the war? While I was still in Presho, I was fine during the day. I enjoyed revisiting my old haunts, seeing familiar faces, hearing the Sharish dialect. But at night, when I went to bed and closed my eyes, they would all pass before me in a procession. I saw all my friends from Presho one by one, as well as my family. So I told myself that I couldn't possibly mourn so many people 
that I had to select just a few to mourn, a handful who would stand for all those I remembered. I chose five people, my parents, my cousin Edith, Shania Ferdi, and my dear grandma who had been left behind at home. And somehow it worked. I told myself in this rational, maybe callous way that I would never forget any of those people. But I knew that I simply couldn't mourn so many dead. That was impossible. After all, in Kosice alone, the entire family of my uncle Arpad perished, including Aunt Frida of the gorgeous ginger hair and Tommy, my dear playmate, four years younger than me. And I really didn't manage to get rid of that sad procession. I could still conjure it up at will, but it no longer haunted me willy-nilly. Later on, I came to terms with the trauma of the Holocaust in a more conscious way by deciding that I wouldn't forget, but that I wouldn't submit to it either. That I couldn't let it become the main focus of my life. That I couldn't go on living in this world facing backward toward the Holocaust, toward all those who had died. That I couldn't draw solely on hatred for what had happened. And that this should not, and it did not, become a defining feature of life for me. Thank you. Uh, so this is how Argy remembered the, the end of the war in Budapest and the first months after her return to Eastern Slovakia, and also the lessons that she had extracted from all those horrors. Uh, let me follow this up with a question to Julia. Your father, uh, Ladislav Jan, also known as Lazzo, managed to write a very comprehensive and entertaining autobiography in four volumes. Uh, did your mother ever have a similar ambition? No, on the contrary. Uh, the, she loved telling stories. Uh, she was uh, a wonderful storyteller. And every time people told her that she should write her memoirs, she said no. Uh, I was one of those trying to pressure her into writing it. And she kept saying that she had spent most of her life writing, being a journalist, and that she just wanted to take a rest. So when did she actually accept the idea that she should record her life for posterity in some form? It was only when uh, Jana Juranjova approached her with this idea. And uh, it was the fact uh, that she wouldn't have to be the main driving force behind it, that uh, she wouldn't have to actually sit down and write it. That was one reason. And the other one was that she knew Jana well and she trusted in her and she knew that she would do a, a good and sensitive job. Okay, Jana, when did that idea of persuading uh, Agi to uh, contribute uh, to your knowledge of her life and uh, for you two to shape this into a book, when did that finally arise in your mind? Uh, at, at first, I will say that uh, even in the 90s, I was doing with her quite a long interview for Slovenske Pohlady. At the time, I was editor in the magazine. And then I, I lost it in my mind. And when uh, in 2000 something, six, eight, maybe 10, uh, there were starting to be published many, many memories, memoirs by people in their, in their 80s. Uh, talking about their lives, mostly men. And then I asked myself at first, my colleagues, my friends, it would be nice to have some, some nice woman and uh, that under my nose, there is uh, such a beautiful woman, Aggie, with whom I was just mailing all the time because she was very curious uh, on our family, on, on my son, she was talking about Yulka, about, about Miriam. And so we were, even we were in distance uh, somehow, but we, we, we knew about each other. And um, so I just went to Aspect and talked with my friends, colleagues, uh, what do you think about the idea to have a book, interview book with uh, Agnesha Kalinova. Some of them knew her, so they were just terrified that yes, it's, it's a very good idea, start it. And then when Agi said yes, uh, then the, then started the period of my preparation, which was quite long and very intensive. 
Uh, at that time, I read all books by Jan Kalina, all these memoirs, uh, many books by uh, about about the periods of communism, Holocaust, many uh, any kind of materials, newspaper books, uh, TV shows, films, a lot of. And uh, then uh, then we just appointed meeting. There were two meetings in Munich. Uh, in one of them, we had a nice dinner with you, as, as maybe you, you remember, Peter. And uh, the, these meetings were like three days, four days, maybe twice. Uh, I uh, taped 44 hours and then transcripted and edited and, and all of that which was very nice to do because uh, Aggie was editor herself. So she, she worked uh, fantastically. She, it was very nice to, to, to work with her because she knew what is the text, what, what, what kind of work it is. And, and um, in every period of this work, it was very nice to, to cooperate with her really. Just a moment ago, we heard in the extract that uh, Julia read in English translation that at one point in 1945-46, Agi decided not to look back generally, to uh, somehow uh, encircle her mourning or to limit her mourning to the immediate family, to those five people she remembered best. And uh, you now came to her and you had to cover that uh, part of her life. Uh, was it difficult for her? Uh, because this, was this uh, the first time that she broke her own taboo, so to speak, and went back over the period and remembered other people outside the, uh, the family circle, the whole situation and atmosphere of persecution, both in Slovakia and Hungary? Um. Uh, I was very afraid of this part of the interview. Uh, maybe I was more afraid than her. Um, and I start, I, I read and uh, watched everything which was possible. Uh, she was a part of a project in uh, Milan Šimačka Foundation. And there were material um, taped and also filmed. And I listened, not looked, but listened to this. Um, it was very strong and very uh, hard, but that was maybe the first time when she talked about it such intensively and in such a long way. So when we started to talk about this part of her life, it was not such difficult and such hard as I thought and as I was afraid before that. Uh, and when we, uh, she, she was talking, talking, talking and um, then she asked herself in one moment, oh, uh, what I'm talking about so many people, I'm talking about my family. She was even, she was herself <laughs> a little bit curious about herself that she's not talking about the, uh, all these uh, things, but about people. And it, it was, it was eggy because she liked, she loved people. She loved people very much, all of them maybe, <laughs> which was quite difficult to, 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 I, I couldn't understand even as much she liked people. So um, she talked about everybody, uh, about, about all this family. And, and um, for me, it was like a great epic and uh, very interesting. And even I maybe uh, for, a, for a, quite a, a little time of my life, I, I was more in Agi family than in my <laughs> family, which, which is uh, not so, I, we haven't any a such tragic um, context, but still um, you know, I knew maybe better for some time her uh, cousins than mine. <laughs> Could I, could I add something? Uh, I don't think that even though my mother decided consciously not to live, uh, turn with her to, to the past, it was never actually a taboo for her. She mm. talked about the past and her family to me, for example, when I was little, my favorite uh, fairy tale was, I used to climb into bed with her and say, mommy, tell me the stories about when you were little. 
and they all involved the members of her family. Uh, it was just that she didn't want to dwell dwell on this kind of victimhood part of it. Uh, but then uh, also to follow on to what Diana said, uh, how my mother loved people and she was so devoted to her family. Uh, this was so important to her in the book as well. She saw it as a memorial to that part of the family that uh, that perished. And even though uh, there were so many names and it's almost yeah. impossible to uh, untangle the, the the family relations because it was a very, ex although she was an only child, it was an extended family because her mother came from seven or eight siblings and they all had children and, and, and the and they used to spend fam the family holidays together. So that was very, very important for her to, uh, for them to live on at least in her book. Yeah. Do I, understand it do I understand it correctly that once Aggie decided to work with you, Jana, mm -hmm. there was never any moment of hesitation later on about the usefulness and uh, the importance of the project. She didn't hesitate anymore. Uh, I I don't think she had hesitated. Maybe, of course, she, there were some questions. Is it good? Is it enough? Is it not too long, not too short? Is, is there any, everything? Is it precise and so on? Like, there were many questions and, and of course we were talking about it, but I don't think so. Uh, and she liked the work then, she liked it really. Uh, I think she was. It was. It was nice for her to have the book done and to to to, to just that that it's it is. We have now uh, focused a bit on the Holocaust period, but were there other areas or periods in Aggie's life uh, where you felt that they were difficult for her to talk about? Uh, what about her changing attitudes to the communist regime, for example? Um, she wasn't. Uh, it, uh, we uh, the first meeting was uh, was closed with fifties with Stalinist period, and uh, she didn't like it uh, in how 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 it was done. So then we when we met again after some weeks in Munich, and we started our second meeting. We 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 went back and do it once more. Uh, did it once more, and I, I don't think it was. She was quite. Um, it's it's good, but it was not hard or difficult. Maybe it was uh, not such. Um, um, I don't know. Maybe maybe it's it was not uh, closed in in her mind. It was something uh, more lively, but. Uh, as, as the period of the whole book, there wasn't any period which was too hard or too difficult for her to talk about it. Uh, the whole book is talked through the lives of other people and through the relations with people. And, and that's why the book is so, so very, very lively, I think. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, both Ladislav Jan and Agnesha were members of the Communist Party until 1969, when they were expelled. Uh, when did she, to your mind, uh, turn away from communist ideas, from the idea that communism was a good way to a better society? I don't think so. uh, I don't think uh, there is a special moment in the book when she would say this is the moment when I started to think she she had uh, her mind done in this question and uh, the book is the memoirs you know the, she she remembers she talked something from the past so I I don't think there is a moment uh, some aha moment now I was. Uh, now I, I, I thought something else than when I was younger and so on. Uh, we talked much about this period of her life and um, I asked her about it and there was one thing that these people were very young and they had no parents after the war, which was very painful. And they were, you know, you need pay, you need parents maybe in also in, in your 50s or 40s and 60s if, if you are lucky. Uh, the, the past generation, when the past generation is really lost, the young people maybe had no um, 
you know, so they are lost also in somehow. So that's the part of the book when uh, there were ideals, um, people were lost maybe in their lives through the war, many people were really lost for, so, um, uh, maybe this 50s, that's the period which is not quite uh, open, but I, I don't, I didn't want to push her. I didn't want to, to let her to, to talk about something which is not maybe um, nice to her or something like that. As has been mentioned, uh, Agi managed to avoid imprisonment under the Nazis, but she was jailed in Bratislava in 1972 at the beginning of the so-called normalization period, which started with the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia in the summer of uh, 1968, and with the uh, change in the highest party office in the Czechoslovak Communist Party in the spring of 1969, when Alexander Dubček was replaced by Gustav Husák. Uh, let's hear uh, Agnesha's uh, account of that tragic comic episode of her life as told to Jana Juráňová, first in a short extract from the Slovak original and then again in Julia's rendition of the English translation. We're talking so, about the arrest. Yeah. So the first lines uh, of Agi's answer, uh, the question is, a čo bolo s tebou? Prvý deň ma na tej februárke celý deň vypočúvali, preberali so mnou celý môj život, Spisovali zápisnicu a večer mi oznámili, že na mňa uvalujú vyšetrovaciu väzbu. Nič som sa nemohla opýtať, ani čo je s dcérou a či tam manžel tiež ostáva. Posadili ma do auta a odviezli do justičného paláca do zadného traktu, kde bola väznica. Tam mi okamžite zobrali všetky osobné veci, kázali mi vyzlieť sa a dali mi akési hrozné oblečenie. Aj to bolo proti vtedy platným predpisom. Uh, can I just say before I read it in English that it's not just my rendition, but mine and my husband Peter's. We translated the book jointly. <laughs> uh, so what happened to you? That first day at the secret police headquarters, Februarka, I was interrogated for a full day. They went over my whole life and typed everything up. In the evening, they informed me that I was being remanded in custody. I didn't get a chance to ask any questions like what was happening to my daughter and whether my husband was also being held there. They put me in a car and drove me to the Palace of Justice to the rear of the building where the prison was. There they took all my personal effects, got me to undress and issued me some unspeakable clothes. That too was against the rules as I could read for myself in the prison regulations which stated that while in detention, you were entitled to keep your own clothes. They threw me into a cell where apart from me, there was one other woman, not much older than me, quite nice, normal, civilized. She said she was a teacher, that they had concocted some charges against her, but she was due to be released soon. We shared a cell for two days. Next day, I was taken to the ground floor for questioning. I think four people took turns interrogating me. They started accusing me of all sorts of things. They brought up the special issue of the uh, of Kulturny Život uh, that came out in the summer of 1968 before Dubček's meeting with Brezhnev at Cherna Natiso. And we were getting signatures for the petition, Sme s vami, buďte s nami, we have your back, you should have ours, uh, to give our politicians the courage not to be intimidated by the Russians. They kept asking over and over, who had written this, who had organized that, who had sent us the text from Prague? They were particularly interested in who was the author of the introduction to the petition. Another thing they wanted to know was who had written the caption to the cartoon by Marianne Vanek. They wouldn't believe me when I explained that the artists who drew the cartoons also wrote the captions. I shouted at them that the introduction was not signed. It was an anonymous text that expressed the view of the whole paper. And even if one of the staffers had written it, it made no difference which one. Perhaps two people had penned it. I might have been one of them. I couldn't rule that out. I really could no longer remember. I reminded them that the special issue was published officially and wasn't even banned in retrospect. It was sold openly. So what was the point of digging it up now? They spent half a day banging on about this one thing. 
I kept telling them that it was organized jointly and that it had been signed by everyone who passed our stand in the street. I was livid. The interrogators obviously had no clue what they were talking about, how a paper was run, who was responsible for what, and they weren't interested in either. The only thing they cared about was finding something to charge me with. Later, later on, I learned that on the same day they detained us, they picked up some 30 or 40 other people, a whole convoy. Everyone was brought to Februarka, but none of the others were detained. I guess they were trying to drum up some kind of Zionist plot. The evening paper, Vecernik, carried a brief item stating that the Zionist group had been exposed. But after a few days, the group shrunk to two people, Lazzo and me. What was it like in prison? Well, for the first few days, I was interrogated by the same three or four incredibly stupid and frenzied Eshtede guys. They kept asking me over and over again if I had written my husband's book of jokes and if I had translated it. They kept getting everything wrong. They claimed that Lazzo had written my articles for Kulturni Život. They had no idea what was an original text and what was a translation or what it meant to edit or be responsible for a text. They kept trying to prove that I had done something wrong, to accuse me of something, and I couldn't for the life of me understand what cry, uh, crime I was supposed to have committed. Some, some of our friends, who had also been brought in for questioning, told me later that as they walked down the corridor, they could hear me yelling at the men behind the locked door. I really can't stand, stand stupidity. It drives me up the wall. Thank you, Julia, for reading this extract from Agi's recollections of the last phase of your family's life in Bratislava. Uh, now, Jana, uh, have any questions remained unanswered? Uh, or if you reread the text afterwards, did you feel that you should have uh, pressed more on this point or that point? No, absolutely not. Um, I, I worked on the book like uh, it was a very friendly interview. And uh, that was the method which was very good one because, um, you know, I was younger from Eggy, uh, one generation and several years maybe. And uh, I it, she was a friend of mine and I loved her very much. And I, I knew she had a brilliant memory. Uh, she, were, she, she could talk, she, was, she could talk very interesting. And uh, I just um, I just do as as much as I could from all of this, and there it was like really like epic all this interview, and I needn't to push on something. Uh, I was not curious on anything else that she told. It was for me it was something terrific because I thought at first it would be something like two hundred pages, you know. And then it was 400. So um, I, was, I was satisfied absolutely with all of this. Uh, I only tried to, to, to have in the book uh, the voice of Agi because she was notorious uh, known for people. And some people told me that uh, in, in Slovakia, in Slovak language, it was like they would listen to her in the radio, that it was the diction of the language in some parts, in some sentences is precisely her. And that it was very nice for me to, to listen. Let me say something I should have mentioned earlier. Uh, the word februarka is perhaps not familiar to everybody. Uh, mm -hmm. This is the setting of the extract we uh, just heard a minute ago, and it was the seat of the secret police, the secret police headquarters in Bratislava. Um, Jana, where do you see uh, the highlights of Agis retrospective? What was for you uh, uh, the most important part, uh, or where for you the most important parts of the book and uh, the ones from which you learned most? Uh, the most important for me is the book as the whole, because as I written then in the preface or somewhere, it was something like the copy of the 20th century. And that was very interesting for me. And it was beautiful for me to, to, 
talk with somebody whom I knew before that, but uh, a woman who lived through all these peaks of the 20th century, like Holocaust, war, 50s, 60s, emigration, 70s, normalization, then uh, after the emigration, the contact with the Slovakia and Czechoslovakia, and after the November, uh, her, her returning many times and, and uh, cooperating and relation, relationships with uh, people in Slovakia, in Czechoslovakia and Czech and so on. So the whole, th the whole book is for me like something uh, very precise because I, I liked the idea of, the, of, the, of this uh, copying the 20th century kind of life which is really very um, speakable or I, I, I couldn't not find the word for every part of this. There are many lives uh, which can copying the, the century uh, through another way, you know, this different, very much different, but this one is something which I, I learned from it a lot. Like I am living in the country, in the context, in the Europe, and uh, this is the living history of the part of the world from which I am. Julia, could you learn something new from the book? Was there something that you hadn't heard from uh, the horse's mouth, if I may, may say it so, before? Um, I don't think so. I think I've heard most of the stories. Uh, I think maybe some of the details. Actually, now I remember, I think one of the stories, which I think is quite typical of my mother when uh, she went to uh, the World Exposition in Brussels. <laughs> and, uh, uh, 1958. And, uh, yes, and she was issued uh, with uh, just one tin of food uh, by Chedok, the uh, travel agency, and she had no implement to open it with. And so she was trying to force it open. And in the end, she was so furious and she just, she just uh, threw it across the room in the hotel. And then she decided, uh, and I think this was just typically her, that uh, she wasn't going to let herself be humiliated by this, uh, the fact, that by the, the way she was being treated uh, by the state that sent her out there officially and yet didn't make it possible for her to eat and that she would enjoy herself nevertheless. And she just went out and kind of defiantly. Uh, back to Jana. Uh, in retrospect, uh, given all the tragedies that Agi had to witness, do you think that she was satisfied with her life and that she was, if one could it, uh, if one can put it that way, a happy person? Uh, I'm not sure I can answer the question because uh, I was just a friend and interviewer, but I think she had a method how to be happy and how to go through all these terrible things uh, in such a way that, that she didn't belittle them and that these things were huge and important and tragic but uh, it wasn't the method of her life. Like, what, what can you do with that? Uh, it was like she prayed for only some people, but in her heart, there were all of them. So uh, she didn't bother uh, people around her with these stories and she loved people around her. And this method was, I think, doing her happy and also people around her, maybe much more than her. Can I maybe add, uh, I'm, I'm not sure I would describe her as a happy person, but she was incredibly positive. Yeah. I think this, uh, this positive outlook was just, uh, it was her genetic disposition. She was just basically someone who's, who always saw the glass half full. And if things were really bad, she could get really angry but then she actually did something. She just would not passively sit there and let uh, the, the things happen. And I think the what really epitomizes this positive outlook that she had, I think it's a story when she was about 16 or 15 uh, and she was going to go on her first skiing trip uh, with uh, some friends as a grown-up, not as a child. And she, uh, uh, she contracted 
uh, scarlet fever or some of those children's diseases that are very difficult if you get them at a uh, later age. So she was confined to her bed and couldn't go. And people came to, uh, to commiserate her. And her response was, oh, well, at least I had fun looking forward to it. And I think this is really <laughs> her approach to life that sums it up. She always found there's some silver lining in everything. Yes, there are several, several sentences like that. It, it could be mottos of the book. Yes, at least I was looking forward. <laughs> and uh, Julia, uh, was I happy with the way my seven lives turned out? Oh yes, uh, she was. She was very happy with it. I, I I remember that when she saw the very first draft, uh, she was a bit concerned because uh, the the first draft, which was rough, which was just basically a transcript of what she said, she felt that it needed quite a bit of editing because although uh, Jana's idea was to use the methods of oral history, so it was meant to sound like spoken language. She still felt that as a journalist, she couldn't uh, allow sentences that were half, half formed. Uh, but then when the, both of them worked uh, a lot on, on the editing, I think it went through several drafts, she was very happy with the result. And uh, also uh, the fact, as I mentioned earlier, that this was a, sort of a memorial now to uh, those uh, members of her family who perished. Can you tell us something, Julia, about the echo that the book has uh, caused in, let's say, Hungary, Slovakia, and some other countries where it has been published? I think uh, Jana would be better placed to talk about the response in Slovakia. Um, the book was a big success and we were even, we, we were afraid a little bit that people maybe do not re remember her or something like that, but it was a big success in Slovakia. There were several presentations uh, with many people, like 200 or something like that, which is a really for this uh, context, a lot of people. And um, uh, book was sold several times. There is also ebook and uh, even it's now maybe in 10 years after the after the book was publishing it still is uh, selling and uh, i think really it was big success i must say one of the biggest of from aspect uh, book edition i think on the aspect uh, website there are uh, lots of comments people sent in and mm -hmm. i think what struck me was that it was mostly people, mine and Yana generation, who really appreciated the book. People who remember the period of the uh, 1960s, but very vaguely, who were too young to uh, really participate in it. And so uh, some of the concepts really rang a bell, but uh, what my mother has done was supply uh, a lot of meat, a lot of detail of what it felt like uh, living living in those days. Yes, because we were we were living in the parallel realities. For example, my, gen my generation, uh, I was dissident. I, I haven't this time time of context. So for us, it was it was really opening book. Like we we can see how how the life was going on in the parts when we were not present. Okay. And what about Hungary, Yulka? Well, there were some positive reviews, uh, uh, but uh, I, I'm not aware of a kind of huge response. I think the, the publishing house uh, brought it out uh, as part of a very acclaimed series called uh, Facts and Witnesses. And it was, a, if I'm not mistaken, the only translated book on that, in that series. Otherwise, they only published books by uh, Hungarians, and this was really because uh, of uh, the fact that a part of it it's set uh, in Hungary, uh, and uh, I don't think it sold terribly well. But then I don't think many of those titles do. But uh, the the critical response was very positive. 
Well, let's hope it's the same in the United States. I mean, the critical response and that it will evoke a lot of interest. Uh, we have now spoken for something like an hour, a good hour. Uh, I would therefore like to uh, give the word back to Pavla Niklova, who may have collected some questions from viewers and participants in this Zoominar. Well, thank you so much, all of you, but the Julia and Jana for this wonderful talk and for bringing uh, Aggie's life to, to our lives. And um, it's also wonderful. It reminds me this morning, I heard on TV that um, in the United States, how many uh, public sculptures, uh, statues are there and like out of 50, 47 are men. So it's wonderful to have a, you know, such a strong and uh, invigorating story about a woman who kind of represents the also the whole history of the 20th central of the 20th century in Central Europe. So thank you very much. And um, there are a few questions from one gentleman, Jean Fosner, and um, basically all of them or three of them go back to how uh, Agi managed to escape and um, basic first of them are in Slovak if uh, he was asking whether whether people whether were they are still allowed to leave or no and the, why Agi escaped just herself uh, to Budapest why not the whole family I think that's probably for me to answer. So the, I think the first question, uh, the, the last one I did uh, answer, but I'll just repeat it, uh, because her, uh, at, at that point, uh, they were only deporting young girls. So the danger for her parents wasn't as imminent. So I think as many other uh, Jews, they hoped uh, it wouldn't come, that the worst wouldn't happen. But also because my... Uh, my mother's uh, grandmother was still alive and uh, she was very ill and they didn't want to leave her alone and so that is really why they just dispatched their daughter uh, and uh, as for the convent and uh, why i think the question was could why did they have to escape and could they not move freely in and out first of all uh, I think, uh, as you would know if you read the whole book, uh, it wasn't an ordinary convent. It was actually a correction institution, basically for girls who had committed some misdemeanors or uh, who you know, otherwise would have ended up in prison. So the regime was very strict. And uh, once my mother was admitted there, she could only leave on very, very rare occasions, for example, when she had a dentist appointment. So they needed to ask permission. And uh, those girls that fled, that uh, were mentioned at the beginning of the excerpt, those were the girls that were being moved from the other uh, place in Ketchkamit, the other convent, uh, to Budapest because of the moving front. And uh, they were being escorted basically almost like criminals and some of them escaped on the way. And I think there was another question about whether it was known that they were Jewish. So initially there were two or three Jewish girls in hiding there and only the, the, the head, the, the mother superior and some of the nuns knew about it. But it gradually became known a little bit that they were different, although they were not allowed and the girls were not allowed to talk about the world as it was called. Also because, uh, not just because of the, the, these girls who were there hiding, but because the nuns didn't want them to exchange uh, uh, the stories about uh, the various strange exploits, the, the other uh, wards. Uh, and then uh, later, as uh, the persecution of Jews uh, accelerated in Hungary, uh, the convent accepted some more Jewish girls. And I think this was the excuse my mother and her friend Marika used to persuade the, uh, the leadership there to let them go because they said they'd been there for over two years now. And by then 
uh, it may have become known that they were Jewish. And so by staying there, they basically jeopardized everyone else. May I say a few remarks on the general situation to which I presume uh, Mr. Fosner, if I understood the name correctly, uh, refers to, and that is the general uh, position of Jews in Slovakia vis-a-vis -vis Hungary, and whether there was a lot of movement across the border from Slovakia into Hungary, and how did it go on, and so on. Well, there was a considerable number of escapes from Slovakia to Hungary, throughout the uh, period up to, nine, up, to the, up to spring 1944, when the Germans moved into Hungary, uh, simply because Hungary, for all its faults, had a somewhat freer political system. A parliament was still uh, working in Hungary. Uh, the anti-Jewish measures were in place, but they did, had not led to mass deportations by spring 1944. And therefore, uh, for Slovak Jews uh, who uh, were under the threat of deportations uh, uh, since 1942, Hungary seemed like a possibility to escape from uh, Nazi suppression. And so many tried to get to Hungary. Uh, as to the whole families going there, well, this was always uh, for logistic problems more difficult than for individual escapees. And most of these uh, escapees from Slovakia were young people. Uh, there were several networks who helped them. One, for example, uh, was the network of Orthodox Jewish communities. The other one was on the other side of the spectrum, so to speak, political spectrum, those were the young Zionists. And in this respect, I would like to mention one name, uh, somebody called Tibor Fischer, who after the war was called Stibor Ribar, uh, was a prominent uh, publishing manager in Prague, also came from Slovakia, and he managed to escape to Budapest at about the same time as Agi. Uh, and he was helped there enormously by that ne underground network of young Zionists. And he managed to survive until the end of the war and he returned to Czechoslovakia in 1945 and wrote a memoir of about 500 uh, pages, which was published some six, seven years ago in Czech mm -hmm. and which I think should be translated into uh, English at least so that other people can, uh, so that people in other countries can read it. And this gives a very full account of the conditions in Budapest between, let's say, 1942 and 1944, 1945. Well, thank you very much. Um, there was another question from the same gentleman. Did Agi go back to Fabruarka after 89? maybe talk to those incredible, stupid Esteba guys. No, she didn't. <laughs> but uh, maybe I should mention that uh, my daughter, uh, Miriam, who is a theater maker, uh, she uh, put together a play based on my father's life and uh, his cabarets. And while uh, working on it, she was interested in looking at the secret police files that uh, existed on our family. And my mother and I never really wanted to see those because uh, we really weren't interested in finding out who uh, of our friends may have been informing on us. So uh, at my daughter's instigation, uh, I uh, requested to see uh, the, the file on my father and I discovered some really incredible things. Uh, my mother uh, was no longer alive then. Some would have made her laugh. Some would have made her really furious. We didn't find out about anyone informing on us, but uh, one interesting thing was that uh, even though it was my father who ended up serving uh, time in prison and my mother hadn't been charged, she was the primary focus of the secret police's uh, interest. She was uh, called uh, Objekt Olina, and my husband was just a uh, manjel objekta, as they called it, <laughs> the objects, uh, the subjects' uh, husband. And uh, 
the idea of uh, uh, installing that bug in our uh, in our apartment uh, really came up already in 1969 as as early as autumn 1969 and it was only because the uh, secret police were so inept that it took them four attempts and a year and a half to actually install it so uh, I discovered quite a lot, but uh, no, my mother didn't go to Februarka itself, uh, but some filmmakers from England who made a film about my father, they, they went there and that was before 1989. They took some photos uh, of the building on the outside and they were uh, apprehended and taken in for interrogation. They pretended to be tourists and they were actually very pleased because they got to see one of those interrogation rooms with their own eyes. In the meantime, there was another uh, question from Bibiana Horvath. Uh, děkujem. Hello, Julia. It's so important to keep having these conversations and keep it all alive to avoid it from happening. I'm curious about your mom getting away from being transported, pretending to have sciatica. Uh, I wonder, was that so easy to avoid such a terrible fate by stating that they actually cared for health issues at that time? Obviously so good that it happened. Right, hello. <laughs> uh, hello, Viviana. Uh, it wasn't that easy. Uh, my uh, mother's cousin or uncle uh, was a doctor. He was a orthopedic surgeon and uh, he showed my mother how to fake the symptoms, which are very, or at least in those days, were very difficult to prove. Basically, the only way they could, and, and my mother pretended she could not move, she couldn't stand. Uh, and they bend your knees in various ways and your legs. And uh, there are certain movements that cause acute pain and others that, that don't. And so my mother was taught how to fake these symptoms and uh, they believed her, uh, but, uh, I, I think she was really, really lucky, uh, and and it certainly wasn't because they cared about uh, her health. And I think I heard of other cases when they actually took girls uh, from their bed uh, and deported them, nevertheless. But uh, in her case, luckily, this ploy worked. And would you like to comment a little bit on um, after on about the time after the Velvet Revolution? how um, your mother, what, what, what it meant for her? Oh, uh, she, was, she was overjoyed. She was exhilarated. She, like I think many of us, uh, we really didn't think that uh, that regime would ever end. Uh, it was uh, really wonderful for her to keep going back, uh, seeing her friends. Uh, but she was also very concerned about the developments. Uh, to be honest, she wasn't all too happy about Czechoslovakia splitting up because uh, uh, as, as you could see even from the little presentation, she had lots of friends, uh, lots of Czech friends. Uh, Kulturny život worked closely with uh, literarni noviny, literarni listy. So, and, and also independent Slovakia for her, uh, she couldn't get rid of the association with the wartime Slovak state. And then uh, later on, when Mechiar came to power, she was very, very con concerned about the uh, erosion of uh, uh, democracy in Slovakia. So uh, people sometimes ask her why she never moved back. And she actually stayed in Germany. Uh, she loved going back, but she felt she could not go back and, and live in Slovakia as long as that country hadn't really openly reckoned with uh, the, the, the past. Uh, something that she felt uh, in Germany has really been done uh, much more thoroughly. Well, thank you very much. Um... To all of you, if there are no more questions, I'd like to um, bring among the panelists uh, the president of the society, Mrs. Eva Derman. And uh, let's see if that works. Who would like to also uh, thank you and uh, greet our guests. Thank you.
Thank you. Hello, Eva. Can you see us? Can you hear us? Eva, we can see you. Can you say something if, if we can hear you as well? Eva needs to push the two buttons. Um, just one. Or just one by now. You have to start the mic or to un unmute yourself. But if she can't hear us. <laughs> oh. Can somebody put up a placard saying, please use the button microphone button? Um, I'm gonna write to her. Unmute. So let's give it another minute. And otherwise, because Eva was afraid that her internet would not work. So she also sent me her closing remarks. So if she doesn't come back, I will be happy to read them. <laughs> and that's how it goes these days. Um, okay. Yes. Back. <laughs> Just, I'm sorry, I'm entering my internet was out, so I am sorry. So I am Eva Derman, uh, president of the Society for the History of Czechoslovak Jews. And I would like to extend my thanks to all who joined us today. It is your participation and donations that enable us to be active even during these trying times. Today's event is one of the events in the series <clears throat> of talks on the topic literature by and about Czech and Slovak Jews. This series was organized by the Society for the History of Czechoslovak Jews with the help of the Society for Vedua Umenie, SVU, and is in part supported by a grant from the Czech Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Bohemian Benevolent and Literary Association, BBLA. My special thanks go to our board members, Vera Kalina Levin and Pavla Niklova, who put together today's event, and in particular to our panelists, Julia Sherwood from London, Petra Broad from Prague, and Jana Juranjova from Bratislava. Our next talk in this series, still on Zoom, is a talk by Veronika Takerova, a lecturer at Harvard. She will be discussing the ways Kafka was perceived in Czechoslovakia 
from the 1920s to 1989. I hope you will be able to join us on October 7th, October 21st at 7 p.m. New York time. And for now, thank you all again for tonight, for this afternoon. Goodbye. Thank Goodbye. you. Goodbye.